For the events surrounding the execution of the Jesus character, we can find the following in the Gospel of Mark. 14.12 On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, Where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? 14.16-17 The disciples left, went into the city and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. These scenes therefore take place after dusk and Jesus and his disciples are now eating the Passover meal. This would be the start of the 15th of Nisan, after dark and before midnight. We then have 14.30 Truly I tell you, Jesus answered, Today, yes tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself, Peter, will disown me three times. 14.71-72 to 72, He, Peter, began to call down curses, and he swore to them, I do not know this man you are talking about. Immediately the rooster crowed the second time. 15.1 Very early in the morning, the chief priests, with the elders, the teachers of the law, and the whole Sanhedrin, made their plans. So they bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. 15.25 It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. This sets the crucifixion scene at 9am modern time on the 15th of Nisan. This is followed by 15.33 At noon darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. 15.34-37 and at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. So Mark sets the death of Jesus at 3 p.m. modern time on the 15th of Nisan. For the day of the week of the execution, we have 15.42-46. to It was preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath. As evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea took down the body and placed it in a tomb. This has Jesus being placed in his tomb at early evening on a Friday. This Friday is also the 15th Nisan, the first day of the Passover celebrations. For the resurrection day of the week, we have a statement in the story that sets it as a Sunday. 16.1-2 to When the Sabbath was over, very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb. So the chronology set up by the author of Mark and the chronology followed by the authors of Matthew and Luke is specific and unambiguous. Jesus is executed on a Friday, 15th Nisan, and he is pronounced as resurrected on the following Sunday morning. To find the purported year of death for the Jesus of the Synoptic Gospels would now seem an easy task. In what year, or years, during the prefecture of Pontius Pilate, 26 to 36 common era, did the 15th of Nisan fall on a Friday? But, along then comes the author of John, who complicates the matter somewhat. For the same narrative in the Gospel of John we have, 13.1 to 2, it was just before the Passover festival, the evening meal was in progress. 13.38 Then Jesus answered, Will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows you will disown me three times. The author of John does not class the evening meal scene as a Passover meal, but it is evening, so for this author it is not yet the 15th of Nisan. The story then progresses to the arrest scene. 18.24 Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas the high priest. 18.27 Again Peter denied it and at that moment a rooster began to crow. It is now daylight after the group meal but it is still not yet the 15th of Nisan. For the Hebrew calendar for the period a day runs from sunset to sunset so night comes first then the daylight hours. 18.28 then the Jewish leaders took Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning, and to avoid ceremonial uncleanliness, they did not enter the palace, because they wanted to be able to eat the Passover. 
The captives of Jesus have not eaten their Passover meal yet, therefore this would not be the morning of the 15th of Nisan, because the Passover meal is eaten during the night of the 15th of Nisan, which would precede the morning. This event would be the morning hours of the 14th of Nisan at the latest. We then progress to the trial and the crucifixion, 19.13-14. to 14. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat. It was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about noon. The author now confirms that this is midday on the 14th of Nisan, but he has not yet indicated which day of the week it is. 19.16-18 to 18, Finally Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. 19.30 When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. The author of John therefore establishes his Jesus character being crucified and dying just after midday on the 14th of Nisan, unlike the authors of Matthew, Mark and Luke who place the crucifixion and death event on the 15th of Nisan. For the day of the week on execution, John gives us 19.31. Now it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. 19.42 Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. This informs us that John's Jesus died on a day of preparation before a special Sabbath, and a day of preparation for the Passover. So the author of John is now indicating that his Jesus character died on a Friday during the daylight hours of the 14th of Nisan. For the resurrection we have 20.1 Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. This confirms an empty tomb scene taking place on a Sunday. All four Gospels therefore indicate the Jesus figure dying on a Friday during the daytime and being announced as resurrected in the morning of the following Sunday. The concept of dying on a Friday and resurrecting on a Sunday is therefore clearly key to the story and intrinsically linked to the seven day Sabbath cycle and not to the lunar solar calendar. It seems the death and resurrection scene has to take place from Friday to Sunday during the period of the first full moon after the sighting of the first crescent moon after the spring equinox. We know the symbolism in the story is not linked to the lunar solar calendar because the Synoptic Gospels claim the death to be on the 15th of Nisan while John claims it was on the 14th of Nisan. So while the day of the month might be important to the individual stories it is the time of the year and the days of the week that are key to the story as a whole. In calendar terms to identify the precise year being indicated in the story the day of the month discrepancy between the 14th and the 15th of Nisan would be extremely significant if there were only one calendar in operation at the time, that time being circa 30 common era through to 150 common era. The period between the purported event and the latest estimated date for the writing of the purported event. If everyone celebrated Passover on the same declared day, the authors would be indicating different years of death, not just a different 24-hour period, because the 14th of Nisan and the 15th of Nisan could not both be on a Friday in the same year. But we know from the documented historical record that a standardised Hebrew calendar in the area of Palestine, circa 30 to 150 common era, was not the situation. In fact, there was no standard Hebrew calendar in Palestine from the 2nd century BCE through to the 4th century CE. In the time period of the Gospels, in this specific area, there were at least two main calendar systems. One of the systems was an empirical lunar solar calendar. This was a rabbinic calendar favoured by the temple priests. The priests controlled which particular day each year or month would start. The declaration of the start of a year or a month was announced upon the first confirmed sighting of a new crescent moon. If, at the physical time of the first appearance of this lunar event, which lasts for just one hour after sunset, low on the western horizon, it happened to be cloudy and the event could not be visibly observed, 
the start of the new year or the new month would not be announced. It would be stalled until the following evening or until the new crescent moon was visually observable. If the situation persisted, the priests would then override the weather and declare the new month started. This monthly stroke yearly calendar was therefore random and not fixed. Any given month could have 29, 30 or 31 days dependent solely on the weather conditions. Contrast this with the fixed pattern of the seven day week which existed before the creation of this human controlled monthly calendar. The different nature of the random month and the fixed week system might seem problematic but it did not actually cause any problems. In any calendar system there is no actual link with the days of the week to the days of the months. They are always two separate cyclical systems running concurrently with each other. Given the operation of this empirical calendar it would be impossible to determine in which year between 26 and 36 common era the 14th or the 15th of Nissan fell on a Friday because the year, day of month and day of week combination is completely random and totally dependent on which particular day the temple authorities declared the first of Nissan had begun. This start of the year stroke month declaration is not recorded. We therefore have no possible system of interrogation that we can employ today in order to find out when, in terms of our Gregorian calendar, the relevant days fell on what would be a Friday in any given year. Computer algorithms can tell us when it should have been and such algorithms are employed to do just that. But that does not confirm on which day of the week the declaration of the sighting of the crescent moon actually occurred, nor could it. Running concurrently with this rabbinic calendar was a mathematical 364 day calendar with 13 months and 52 weeks. This calendar was completely in sync with the seven day Sabbath but would have lost one and a quarter days against the seasons every year. The attraction of this calendar was that the holy days were ensured not to fall on a Sabbath day because it was mathematically rhythmic not random. This calendar was favoured by certain Jewish non-temple sects and other non-temple oriented members of society. There therefore exists, for different communities in Palestine during 30 to 150 common era, the possibility that they celebrated the Passover in any given year on different days of the week. We have no way to confirm which of these calendars or communities the Gospel writers belong to. If the author of Mark and the author of John follow different calendars, the possibility would then exist that they do both indicate the same intended year of death and that in this particular year, Friday 15th of Nissan was equal to Friday 14th of Nissan when taking both calendar systems into account. This is even possible if the two Gospel writers both followed the rabbinic lunar solar calendar but came from different geographical areas in which the priests in one area declared the sighting of the crescent moon on a different evening to the temple priests and communication between the two communities was not perfect. Add to this the fact that the two writers are writing some 40 to 120 years after the events they purport to represent and from an area far distant from the events themselves without any reliable dating records of the time. Remember the temple and its contents were destroyed in 70 common era before the gospels were written. So the writers themselves could simply be mistaken in their personal views on which weekday of the month of Nisan started within the year they write about. In their errors, they could have made differing errors rather than the same error, selecting different days of the month for the Friday they target in their story. Therefore, many variables and differing outcomes are possible. All of this means that we cannot use the death narrative data from the Gospels to pinpoint the author's intended year of death. We can only ascertain that it is being set to between 26 to 36 common era. This does not cause too much of an issue to the 70 year argument which argues the year of death is purported by the authors to be the 16th year of Tiberius, 30 common era to us today, because all four gospels place the execution within this ballpark and the inclusion of Pilate's prefecture, John the Baptist, Herod Antipas and Caiaphas 
are all date stamps used by the authors to incorporate this particular year. The concept of dying on a Friday and resurrecting on a Sunday found in all four Gospels is purely Sabbath observance symbolism. The events are meant to establish that the Son of God died on the sixth day, was at rest in his tomb on the seventh day, the day of rest, the Sabbath, and resurrected on the first day, the first day of creation. This is so theologically Jewish that it is painfully obvious, a theological concept that seems to have been hidden in plain sight for nearly 2,000 years. We can add to this theological symbolism in the stories the fact that Mark, Matthew and Luke have Jesus die after the Passover meal, while John has Jesus die before the Passover meal. Here, John depicts Jesus as the Passover lamb being sacrificed because he is sacrificed at the same time that the Paschal lamb is sacrificed, while Mark et al. prefer to depict their Jesus as creating his own Eucharist ritual. We should also consider why it is that Paul himself does not link Jesus' death to the Passover period at all or to any date range. This is because Paul is a pre-temple destruction Gnostic Christian and his Jesus is a metaphorical Jesus. Paul wrote before the temple was destroyed, so he is not trying to link his demigod's death scene to the temple destruction event. Matthew, Mark, Luke and John write after the temple was destroyed and create intrinsic links with their Jesus' death to the destruction event and the destruction prophecy from the book of Daniel. If we cannot use the death narrative in the Gospels to pinpoint the intended year of death for the canonical Jesus, what other data can we refer to? In Luke 22.7-13 we have There came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John saying, Go and prepare the Passover meal for us that we may eat it. In 23.54-56 it was the day of preparation and the Sabbath was beginning. The women who had come with him from Galilee followed and they saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Here we can see, as with the author of Mark, the author of Luke also records the death on a 15th of Nisan that fell on a Friday during the prefecture of Pilate. But the author of Luke goes further and tells his readers the age of Jesus at death and the year of death. In 3.1 we have it was in the 15th year of the Emperor Tiberius and in 3.23 Jesus was about 30 when he began his ministry. The Jesus in the Gospel of Luke is then executed at the next Passover in the 16th year of Tiberius at the age of 30 and this establishes the 70 year prophecy in the book of Daniel precisely. Luke somewhat shoots himself in the foot in 2.1-7 by referring to a census ordered at a time when Quirinius was the governor of Syria. The census apparently required all men to register in their place of birth and so Joseph had to travel to Bethlehem with the pregnant Mary to register. According to Josephus, Quirinius became governor in 6 Common Era. But the author of Luke has most likely added this item to his story of Jesus without regard to dates in order to satisfy the prophecy of Micah 5.2 from the Old Testament, a prophecy that states the Messiah will come from Bethlehem, not Nazareth. But you, O Bethlehem, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel. This is a prophecy fulfillment opportunity that the author of Mark has failed to address. His Jesus comes from Nazareth. Therefore, the author of Luke simply puts the situation in order. For the author of Matthew, we find further confirmation of the year of death. 26.17 On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? 27.61-63 Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. The next day, the one after the preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days I will rise again. Here we see, in line with Mark and Luke, the author of Matthew also opts for the death on a 15th of Nisan that fell on a Friday 
during the prefecture of Pilate. Matthew then seems, at first, to throw a complete spanner in the works with his slaughter of the innocent scene ordered by Herod the Great, who is believed to have died in 4 BCE. However, we know from its omission in the works of Josephus that no such slaughter event ever took place, and it is simply scriptural plagiarism of God's slaughter of the Egyptian children in the Jewish Passover story. Josephus carefully records all of the atrocities Herod inflicted on the people of the Judea, but he does not mention the slaughter of babies, which would have been the worst of all atrocities. But more importantly, not all scholars agree that Herod died in 4 BCE. There are many scholars who forward the view that Herod died in 1 BCE. The reason for the 4 BCE view is that, in Josephus' account of Herod the Great, in his Antiquities of the Jews, Book 17, Chapter 6, Paragraph 4, Josephus mentions an eclipse of the moon. And that very night there was an eclipse of the moon. Josephus speaks of this as happening before the death of Herod, Chapter 8, Paragraph 1. When he had done these things, he died, the fifth day after he had caused Antipater to be slain. The eclipse has long been associated with an eclipse known to have happened on March 13th, 4 BCE. The data on lunar eclipses published by NASA reveals this to be a partial eclipse visible from Jerusalem just before moonset in the early hours of the morning. However, many who have analysed this data, and the data from Josephus, point out that this is only 29 days before Passover in that year and Josephus crams a lot of time-hungry travel events in between the eclipse and the Passover, with Herod's death being placed after the eclipse and his funeral occurring before the Passover, so much so that there seems to be insufficient time to achieve all of the events that are mentioned. The NASA data for 1 BCE reveals that the next visible lunar eclipse for Jerusalem took place on the 10th of January 1 BCE and it was a total eclipse, fully visible after midnight and therefore very noteworthy. A further point to note is that this eclipse gives far more time between the eclipse date and the next Passover in which to fit all of the events that Josephus mentions. This data does therefore allow for Josephus' comments to be suggesting that Herod died after January the 10th 1 BCE and before Passover in that year. The historic textual and the NASA lunar data together does therefore allow the narrative in Matthew to be maintaining the 28th year of Augustus 1 BCE stroke 1 CE birth concept. If the author of Matthew himself perceived that Herod died in the 28th year of Augustus, then, along with Luke's 16th year of Tiberius' death date of 30 Common Era, Matthew too alludes to his Jesus character dying at the age of 30 in 30 Common Era, and therefore being born 70 years before the fall of the Temple. If we view this from the reverse prophecy fulfilment direction, we can say that Matthew and Luke's Gospels record that the Temple is destroyed 70 years after the advent of the Messiah as a punishment from God because the Messiah was rejected, as per ancient scriptural prophecy. The author of John takes a different approach to the main story. We have already seen that the Gospel of John has the Jesus character executed on a Friday and resurrecting on a Sunday during the prefecture of Pilate when the 14th of Nisan fell on a Friday, according to the calendar that this particular author followed. But for John's Jesus we have more data, data that clarifies the intended year of execution as the 16th year of Tiberius, 30 Common Era. The author of John states that the temple had been being remodelled, meaning the restoration started by Herod the Great, for 46 years at the time of the temple cleansing scene, which the author places at the beginning of his Jesus story, and then he alludes to a three-year ministry. Josephus tells us that Herod decided to restore the temple in his 18th year, Antiquities of the Jews, Book 15, Chapter 11, and now Herod, in the 18th year of his reign, after the acts already mentioned, undertook a very great work, 
that is to build of himself the temple of God and make it larger in compass and to raise it to a most magnificent altitude. Herod's reign started in 37 BCE. 37 BCE plus 18 years gives 19 BCE for the start of the temple restoration. 19 BCE plus 46 years gives 27 common era for John's temple cleansing scene. 27 common era plus a three year ministry gives 30 common era for John's crucifixion scene. To conclude this chronological review of the four canonical gospels, all four gospels were written after the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed. They satisfy, by way of reverse construction writing, the 70 year prophecy in the Old Testament book of Daniel specifically and precisely. The first gospel, Mark, reads like a fantasy fiction rather than a biography. Matthew, Luke and John are enhanced and elaborated plagiarisms of Mark, not independent attestations of events. The gospel writers collectively plagiarise at least a little content from just about every myth and scripture in existence at the time that they wrote. It is with this concurrence of facts that we can say with a good level of confidence that this Jesus character has been invented and placed with precision into a well-defined and required time frame in order to establish a new theology, a requirement that was initiated by the loss of the temple in Jerusalem. This Jesus character for the new theology had to have been born 70 years before the fall of the temple in order to be able to link the temple destruction event with the messianic prophecy in the book of Daniel and according to the collective material in the four canonical gospels that is exactly when this Jesus character was born. Therefore the Catholic and Protestant figurehead is not a historical person mythologized it is a mythical demigod personified as in a complete fabrication. No such character existed in history in any time frame. If you've enjoyed this video and you'd like to know more about the true origins of the Jesus story, there is more information to be found in my book titled 70 available from Amazon in both Kindle and paperback form. The link for this can be found in the pinned comment below the video. Also, please subscribe to my channel by pressing the subscribe button coming along shortly. All best regards, Mike Lawrence, no Tory. Actively campaigning against the religious indoctrination of children in schools. Thank you.